Good morning. Our scripture comes to us today from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descend, descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for forty days, tested by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and with the angels waited upon him. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Stand up. He says that this wilderness is populated with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus, and with Satan. <coughs> Plus there are wild beasts and angels. One of my clergy pals who owns a farm um, up north of Menominee said that she and her husband were out walking around on the property and they came upon a bear den. And they looked down in there and this hibernating bear was laying there with his eyes half open. Just laying there, watching them. <laughs> eyes half open. Well, in this Bible story of Jesus being driven into the wilderness, Mark uses a Greek verb that literally means to throw out. And it's the same Greek verb that is used to describe um, later the casting out of demons and also the turning over the, of the money changers' tables in the temple. It's the same verb. <laughs> Jesus is not on some spiritual retreat here. There's no gentle music and bows of silence. This is Jesus landing headlong into a place that he doesn't want to go. And he's alone, he's deprived, he's exhausted, he's threatened, he's tested. When I picture Jesus in this environment, it is not the Peloton Jesus that I see. Not some buff superhero who overcomes the devil's temptations with no problem at all. The Jesus of the wasteland is not some triumphant, predictable Jesus who was never at risk to begin with. Because if the whole point of this story is that it costs the Son of God nothing, then this wilderness just isn't very believable. In Matthew and Luke's versions of this story, we learn that Jesus was tempted by Satan when Jesus was hungry, and he was lonely, and he was feeling really powerless. And, and, and Satan's voice is louder than God's in this story, especially echoing against this, this expanse of Jesus' isolation that he feels. His circumstances are dire. And it's in this, in the, it's, and it is in the midst of the tricks of his own mind that, I want to say this again, I haven't got it right, and it is in the midst of the tricks his own mind will surely play on him that Jesus has to learn a kind of love and trust that is independent of whatever is going on around him. I'm going to say that again because I got it so screwed up the first time. It is in the midst of the tricks his own mind will surely play on him that Jesus has to learn the kind of love and trust that is independent of what is happening around him. What Jesus shows us as he sits alone in that dust is that we can be loved and uncomfortable at the same time. I recently had a conversation with someone whose daughter is back in jail for violating the uh, conditions of her bail. This is the fourth time that this has happened. She is an only child of a couple 
who are gentle Christian people, gentle people, who have nothing but love to give. That is wilderness. That is sitting at the edge of the cliff with your despair crushing you down. And she says that to love a child through what they've had to love this child through, that is hardcore love. What Jesus holds dear in his heart, as the buzzards are circling, is the hardcore love of God. And sometimes it takes 40 days, or 40 years, or lifetimes. This story of Jesus in the wilderness says that Jesus was with the wild beasts. Now these are not bunny rabbits and the occasional garbage raiding raccoon. These are snakes and jackals. These are scorpions and wild boars and bears, Asian bears with their eyes wide open. It never says that Jesus fights them. He doesn't track the lions or squish the spiders. He also doesn't befriend or bewitch them. It just says that he was with them. I wonder if they were noisy at night. <laughs> you know? Did they beller and roar and skitter all night as Jesus was trying to sleep in the sand with a still hot stone underneath his head for a pillow? I'm not a good sleeper myself. So, I'm thinking I'd have 40 nights no sleep. Which is just when Satan might show up in my wilderness. When I'm exhausted and I'm frustrated. Wilderness can be feelings of betrayal, and worry, and fear, and anxiety, and cravings that seem like mosquitoes all around you all the time, and they just keep pestering you and you swat and you spray and you retreat from them when maybe God is leading you to just sit with them, to just be with them for a while. Because here's the thing to remember. There are angels in that wilderness. The Gospel says that they waited on Jesus. They tended to him. They kept vigil. This is easy to, easy to miss when we're wandering in uncomfortable places. When we're restless and we're hurting and we're sick of being sick and we're tired of being tired, we fixate on our pain. And I say there's nothing wrong with feeling the feels of misery. It's, 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 it's after all why God sent Jesus to us so that God could better understand the human condition. But in the midst of misery, the angels are nearby. Now I have sat in the sand with people and I have sensed and I have seen those angels. And what I've noticed in them, in the people that I've sat in the sand with and in myself too, is that when we, what we really want from these angels is rescue. Of course we want out of that wilderness. And if we believe in God, and if we say our prayers, and if we go to church, and if we do good for our neighbors, then the angels will keep us safe. And this, my friends, is an enticing lie. And it's what Jesus resisted in these stories. The angels in Mark's Gospel don't medevac Jesus out of that wilderness. They tend him. I wonder what they looked like. Wings? Beautiful faces in the sky with choruses of Alleluia? Maybe. Gentle touches? Maybe. Or did they show up as a cool breeze around noon when the sun was so hot? Did they show up as a trickle of cool water in Jesus' throat when he was so thirsty? As the hopeful beauty of a wildflower when the only thing Jesus could see was despair? Maybe all the things that Jesus normally took for granted were more than that. After all, if God created everything, then surely God sends angels in every form, all the time, in every circumstance. 
When we're in that valley of God's of uh, shadows, when we're in that valley of shadows and that wilderness of shadows, God sees us. And this is when and where God sends agents for us. The day of Bob's biggest and most recent operation um, was the biggest snowstorm of last year. I've mentioned that before. So he was scheduled for 8 a.m. surgery. My husband's name is Bob, for those of you who don't know us. The huge waiting room, surgical waiting room at Mayo in Rochester was packed. I mean, there wasn't a chair. There were literally people leaning against the walls waiting to be called. And one after another, names were called, and the crowd thinned. And it started to snow around noon. By 3 p.m., it was just us, Bob and I, and another couple. And they were from Ohio, in that waiting room. He was, gonna, he was there for cancer surgery. The other fellow was there for some cancer surgery. And we saw four, we visited a bit. We saw four o'clock come, and then we saw five o'clock come. And finally, both Bob and this other gentleman were called into surgery at 6 p.m. The blizzard absolutely raged, and I knew I had to drive home. We didn't have a reservation there, and I needed to get him to a place that was truly sterile and all that jazz, you know? And I was nervous about many things. And Lori, that was her name, she and I talked and laughed, just the two of us in that waiting room, and shared until her husband was in recovery and she had to leave. We said our goodbyes. She was my angel. She tended to me, even though she probably didn't realize it. And I prayed that I was her angel. Angels in the wilderness don't always arrive with cures and answers. They arrive because we're sitting in the dusk and because God wants them there. And like Jesus, we emerge from that unpredictable place. We can know that God's promises are rock solid because they have been tested in the most barren of places, and they are true. Amen.